Welcome back to Mrs O'Graham's Maths channel. We are going through the work solutions for the S2 paper from the October-November 2019 ses session. So this is paper 73. Um, and as usual, when I'm putting these ones out quickly after the paper was actually sat, the mark scheme is not available yet. Um, so if you find mistakes in the video, go with any of those corrections so that um, people coming across this video later will know. One is about um, a random variable x. And our first thing is that we have the sum of four independent values of x, that means we are adding four up, uh, sorry, x up four times. We are not timesing x by four, that makes a difference. So the mean gets multiplied by four, the variance also gets multiplied by just four, not four squared. Then part two is that z is four x minus three. This is different because we are doing x times four and then we're taking away three. So the mean is um, the, the mean times four and then minus the three. The variance is just the variance um, times by 4 squared. Um, we don't have the takeaway 3 because uh, adding or taking off a constant doesn't affect the variance. But because that x got multiplied by 4, the variance gets times by 4 squared. Then on question 2, we have a Poisson um, distribution. We have 2.4 cars per minute, which makes 4.8 in 2 minutes. And then we want the probability of less than 4, which is less than or equal to 3. So we do 0, 1, 2, and 3, and add them up using our Poisson formula. Then an approximating distribution for at least 140 cars in a one-hour period. We are using the normal distribution to approximate our Poisson distribution. Um, we need to apply a continuity correction because we're going from a discrete to a continuous distribution. And so we want 140 included. So to go to the right of 140 and still include it, we would take that half off and we get 139.5. Then we work through the normal distribution and we get our answer of 0.6462. On question three, we are given a sample. Um, we're told that the, um, the mean and standard deviation from the group that this was taken from is mu and um, three. And then we have this set of uh, 10 numbers that make up our sample. We want to work out 97% confidence interval for the mean mu. So we can work out our sample mean as x bar. Um, that's 25.9. We also were asked to state a nece necessary assumption. Now, because our sample is small, we can't apply the central limit theorem to um, the distribution of means. Um, so we will then need to assume that the distribution of our times um, that were taken by these competitors is normally distributed. So then we're looking for the middle 97% for our confidence interval. That gives us a tail at the top of 1.5%. Um, so we can work out our Z value to be 2.17 and then apply that to work out our confidence interval here. Um, we're just working through those numbers and we get our final confidence interval down at the bottom there. Finish that question with a nice little one marker testing that you understand what confidence intervals are doing. So uh, for a 97% confidence interval, that means we would accurately find or capture that true value of the mean 97% of the time, which means that we are wrong 3% of the time. So the chance of two um, of these confidence intervals uh, being calculated um, and not actually getting the mean would be 3% each time. So we times that 3% um, by each other and we get 0 0.0009. Question four is hypothesis testing. We've got a 92% chance of trains arriving on time. Sanjeep thinks that that's wrong and the percentage is actually less than that. In his sample of 20 trains, he found 16 of them um, were on time. And we're going to try and work out if that number is low enough to say that they're not meeting the 92% that they claim. Now we're going to apply a binomial model, so we need to state the assumptions that were needed for that. And that is that the chance of um, the train being on time is independent for each individual train, and the probability of those trains being on time remains constant. Then we set up our hypothesis test with our null hypothesis being that the chance was 0.92. And the alternative is that it's less than that. And here's our binomial distribution set up. We are working out the probability that x is less than or equal to 16. So we've got these 16 trains that we found um, when it was tested. Now, if we got less than 16 trains, we would 
be even more inclined to think that the claim wasn't true. So we test out 16 or less. Um, and now this is just my working out here. The green was me keeping track of what each of these lines um, were equal to uh, for it being greater than or equal to 17 and then take that away from 1. So the probability of being less than or equal to 16 is around 7% which is bigger than the 5% we were looking um, at the significance level of. So since that chance is 7%, this is not in the critical region, we accept the null hypothesis, and there's not sufficient evidence to support Sandeep's claim that the, um, the, the trains being on time is less than 92%. If we've got the random variable x with a binomial distribution, and we want to use a Poisson approximation, so we do the number of trials times the probability to get us lambda, and then just work through the Poisson calculations there. Part two, we're told that the probability that y is zero is the same as the probability that y is two. So, um, and then work out lambda. So set those two parts of the Poisson um, formula as equal to each other and work through to solve for lambda. Then one step further, we're given some general um, things about this Poisson distribution. Um, and we're given things in terms of n instead of numbers or, uh, or working out lambda. So um, w the probability that z equals n, just put that into the formula for the Poisson distribution with um, our x value being n, and the same for n plus 1, put that into the formula. And we're told that uh, this one is less than this one. And then part b asks us to actually go on and solve that for n, and I'm going to step through this one because um, it does take a little bit of thinking about with all those factorials going on. So if we first multiply by um, n factorial, then on the left hand side we're just left with 5.2 to the n. On the right hand side we've got 5.2 to the n plus 1. Now if we times um, n plus 1 factorial uh, by, what? Well, sorry, if we, so if we times this top side here by n factorial, then if we did a, let me try and do this to explain over the side, n factorial over n plus 1 factorial. N, n plus 1 factorial would have everything up to n factorial and then times by um, n plus 1. Right, so if you were then cancelling out this with this part, all you're left with would be an n plus 1 underneath, just like that. Okay, and then our next step is I'm going to bring the n plus 1 up here. And then we've got 5.2n plus 1 over 5.2n. Now, just when you move across inequalities, you should just have a mental check that that's okay. n is a positive number, so n plus 1 will be as well. 5.2 to the n is going to be a positive number, so the inequality stays the same, doesn't get reversed. Now, a similar thing with what we just did with the n's. If we did um, 5.2 to the power of n plus 1 divided by 5.2 to the n, then it just means we've got one more on the top than we had on the bottom. So n plus 1 is less than 5.2, meaning that n is less than 4.2. So the, what was it we were asked for? Let me just check. The largest possible value of n would be 4. Question 6 is all about this probability density function. So we first of all need to work out the value of k, or rather show that k is 2, 2 over 9. We know that if you integrate from um, across the whole probability density function, it will be equal to 1. So this is just working through that integration to show that k comes to 2 over 9 when we set it equal to 1. Then find the probability um, of being between 1 and 2. So if we know the value of um, k is 2 ninths, we can put that into um, our probability density function integral. So I've just skipped this, this part up here. I've just used it straight away down here. So I've already done the integration. I'm going to put that there, but with the, the limits of 1 and 2. And then that value gives us our probability. Then find the variance. Um, for the variance, we do um, the expectation of x squared minus the expectation of x all squared. So for the, the x squared part, we need to do our function times x squared and integrate that from 0 to 3. Um, so this is the working out here. And then for the, the e of x part, the mean part, um, we do our function times x, integrate that from 0 to 3. And then the variance will be the first one minus the second one squared. And then number 7, 
we've got um, Bob the Builder and his income uh, used to have a mean of 546 standard deviation of 120 and he's changed his working pattern um, his now his weekly income for 40 randomly chosen weeks is now 581 we can assume that the standard deviation stays the same we want to test at a two and a half percent significance level whether the mean weekly income has increased so the the null hypothesis is that the mean is 546 the alternate hypothesis is that it's 100 it's, it's more than 546 so we test out him getting the 581 from a sample now that's important it was taken from a sample of 40 weeks so when we do our z value over here we get um, we do that division by 120 squared over so that we're working with um, that normal distribution from a sample now working through those probabilities we get to this point here where um, the chance of that is greater than two and a half percent it's not in the critical region therefore we accept the null hypothesis um, it's not unlikely enough for us to think that that couldn't have happened and we'll reject um, the, the, the null hypothesis so there's not sufficient evidence to suggest that Bob's mean weekly income has increased then part two asks us to work out the probability of a type 2 error if his weekly income has actually gone up to 595 so that's the probability that we um, made the decision to accept the null hypothesis that his mean hasn't changed when it actually has so we've accepted this original purple distribution underneath um, when actually it's changed to the green one of 595. Now, the conditions where we will accept that purple distribution is if we um, end up not in that 2.5% tail of the, the purple distribution. So the Z value there is 1.96. Uh, just reading off your tables. Now, if we set that Z would be equal to X minus the mean over the square root of 120 squared over 40, that's from, you know, doing it on a sample, remember? So re rearranging that would give us an X value of 583.2. That's going to be our critical X value. So what is the probability uh, that we get something that's less than 583.2, meaning that we would have accepted the null hypothesis, when actually the mean was 595. So now we work out the probability of getting that value on the green distribution. So that's the working out here. And that comes to 0 0.267. So that is the probability of our type two error. Okay, so hopefully you found that useful. If you're coming back to check how you did in the exams, I'm hoping that this video gives you some hope and you haven't gone away crying. If you found that helpful to go through those work solutions, um, please do us all a favour and like and subscribe down there because it means that it makes my channel more visible to other people. They'll be able to find this video, have it suggested to them and get the same help that you have. All right, good luck with everything else that you've got going on if you're going on to exams now. Um, I hope you do your best.